So rate limiters are supposed to avoid downtimes, but have you ever heard that a rate limiter caused a downtime? This happened with GitHub, where a big chunk of their users saw elevated error rates. In this quick incident dissection, let's take a look into high-level overview of how GitHub does their A-B experiments, how a low-level design decision led to this incident for a large chunk of their users, and conclude with some key things that we should all learn from this particular outage. But before we move forward, I'd like to talk to you about a course on system design that I've been running for over a year now. The course is a cohort-based course, which means I won't be rambling a solution and it will not be a monologue. Instead, a small focused group of 50-60 engineers every cohort will be brainstorming systems and designing it together. This way, we build a solid system and learn from each other's experiences. The course to date is enrolled by 600 plus engineers spanning 9 cohorts and 10 countries. Engineers from companies like Google, Microsoft, GitHub, Slack, Facebook, Tesla, Yelp, Flipkart, Dream11 and many 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 more have taken this course and have some wonderful things to say. The coolest part about the course is the depth we go into and the breadth we cover. We cover topics ranging from real-time text communication for Slack, to designing our own toy load balancer, to Greek buzzes live text commentary, to doing impressions counting at scale for any advertisement business. In all, we would cover roughly 28 questions and the detailed curriculum uh, split week by week can be found on the course page which is linked in the description down below. So if you're looking to learn system design from the first principles, you will love this course. I have two offerings for you. The first one is the live cohort based course, which you see on the left side. And the second one is the recorded course, which you can see on the right side. The live cohort based course happens every two months and it will go on for eight weeks. While the recorded course contains the recordings from one of the past cohorts as is. If you are in a hurry and want to binge learn system design, I would highly recommend you going for the recorded one. Otherwise, the live cohort is where you can participate and discuss things live with me and the entire cohort and amplify your learnings. The decision is totally up to you. The course details, prerequisites, testimonials can be found on the course page arpitbhairi.me slash masterclass and I would highly recommend you to check that out. I put the link of uh, the course in the description down below. So if you are interested to learn system design, go for it. Check out the link in the description down below and I hope to see you in my next cohort. So what actually happened? A large chunk of users saw elevated error rates while using GitHub. Who, who were these users? These users, the users that were affected during this incident were all part of an A-B experiment. Right? So what exactly is an A-B experiment? So what happens is companies run A-B experiment in order to decide which works the best, A or B. Now here, like for example, if you want to change a color of a button, it's a very simplistic example, but it would help you understand. Let's say you'd want to change the shape of the button on the website. Let's say you have it triangle. Now you want to change it to a square. It's a, it's a very fancy website. That's why you have such weird shape buttons, but how you get the gist. So what you do is instead of directly rolling out your changes with respect to a square button to all of your users, what you do is you run an AB experiment. So what AB experiment would do is you create two groups A and B, which is your control and test. So control is your existing behavior and test is the new behavior that you are trying to test. Right? So what happens is you randomly pick a set of users and you randomly show 50% of them the default behavior. So no alterations for them and 50% the new behavior. And then you measure the key vitals of your system. For example, if you are doing A-B experimentation for uh, this particular button use case, how, how likely are people to click on this button would be a key metric that you would be chasing. That hey, for of all the people who I showed uh, a, a button which is in a triangle shape, which is my existing behavior, let's say 10% of people clicked. But when I change my button to a square, 50% people clicked. So this is the huge jump in people clicking that particular button. So what AB experimentation does is it gives us the data. It, it quantifies how good our rollout is going to be. So whenever companies are in doubt on should we go for A or B or, or, or what the variation should be, they always run an AB experiment like we are all lab rats and they run experiment on us to see which one works the best and they roll it out to the rest of the users. 
we in our day to day lives are every single day we are part of at least 50 to 60 ab experiments and we are not even aware of we are companies like instagram facebook twitter what everyone does ab experiments small tweaks in ui small functionality changes and they measure how good their uh, how good that rollout is and if it is really good they would roll out it to 100% of the people otherwise they would not right so this is the idea of ab experiment and now you get the gist now the entire incident is related to ab experiment now what happened so what github says is changes to better instrument ab experimentation for ui introduced an unknown dependency on the presence of a specific dynamically generated file that is served by a separate application a lot of things put into one sentence but let me dissect okay so what happened how ab happens at github so what github does is in in any organization there is a ab service which basically does the measurement of how good a particular variation is right it gets all the events that it wants to do the processing and is the one that decides which user gets what the default behavior or the new behavior how ab experiments happen at github it looked something like this we still not sure we don't have a lot of idea but from that two lines what i could deduce is they have something called as a config generator whose job is to generate configuration that would power an ab experiment so this would be a dynamic configuration for example if i would want to change on the fly change some parameters for example change the color of this button from blue to red shape from triangle to square this could be dynamic configuration which it might be picking from this config generator and because this is a dynamic information of how the interface should behave or another example let me go a little more on the back end side instead of uh instead of this configuration telling how to mold the ui what if this configuration tells where to connect to or where to send events to or from where to fetch the relevant data something around that right we still don't know what was the ab experiment that was run so pure speculation it the configuration that is generated from here could drive the front end configuration generated from here could drive some back end information for example where to fetch data from how to send data to uh, what kind of events are we capturing and what not right but in any case the flow what happens over here is whenever your servers typically your front end servers uh, uh and this specifically happens at github might not be true for all organ or is definitely not true for all organizations so what they do is they load this dynamic configuration from here from this config generator so what happens is this service is responsible for for dynamically generating a configuration file which is sent to all of the front end servers which they use to then power an ab experiment and instrument it basically do a very granular uh, allocation and alterations in the ui right so now what happened is very interesting during an application deployment the file failed to be generated on significant proportion of application deployments so what does this mean this means that due to some issue in deployment or something a deployment was triggered and which obviously this had to generate a lot of files when the request came in so any time the front end server boot up it would made a request to config generator it would have to generate that file and return it over here and then it would start serving the ab uh, experiment to the users so when something happened they again no one specifies what exactly happened but when something happened this service was overloaded this service was overwhelmed because the file failed to be generated on significant proportion of application deployment due to a high retrieval rate being rate limited by the upstream application this is where rate limiter came in so what happened is when a lot of request came in to this config generator this became overwhelmed once this was overwhelmed it stopped generating the file it went down and a lot of front end servers did not even get the file that it needed because they did not get a file that it needed so what happened is the users who were enrolled in that experiment they, they faced error rates because the front end did not know what to render to which user right 
So because of this, and this typically happened because config generator rate limited. If it would not have rate limited, obviously you should always rate limit. But if it would not have rate limited or if had an elevated rate limiting configuration, then it would have sustained. Right. But because this rate, uh, because config generator rate limited, the front end servers did not get the file. So users were not shown the correct variation. Right. And this happened, this happens a lot. <laughs> right. So this resulted in site wide application errors of percentage of users enrolled in the experiment. And how did they mitigate it? Upon detection, we were able to disable the requirement on this file, which restored all of their services, which, which basically makes sense. We, we have seen so many outages and we know that the quickest way to mitigate is rollback. This is kind of a rollback where you removed your dependency on uh, the file that was causing the problem. So they immediately shut it off. So config generator rate limited, it caused that issue. Here we, what we understand is rate limiting is very essential, but the limits specifically for internal service should be tuned very well, very well. Otherwise it would cause outages like this. So their mitigation was to uh, not do this, but what was their long-term fix? Going forward, configuration for AB and multivariate experiment. AB, what I explained was just one variation, but when you have multiple variations, it's called multivariate, uh, multivariate experiment. So configuration for AB and multivariate experiments will be cached internally. Right? This clearly shows that configuration for AB and multivariate experiment, the file contained the configuration to run AB experiment, will be cached internally to ensure successful propagation to dependencies. This clearly means that in the config generator, instead of every time generating a dynamically, uh, in, in, instead of every time dynamically generating the configuration file, they would be generating it once and caching it internally so that the load on the service is reduced. Even if it gets large number of requests, that service would not go down. That is the long term fix. Some solid key takeaways from this. First of all, here we clearly see we should avoid synchronous dependency wherever possible. So with the existing flow that GitHub had, the servers had to call this config generator to generate files and this was all synchronous communication happening. So if this service throttles, so if config generator service throttles, it would take everything down with it. Right? So this is where wherever possible, try to architect your solution in an asynchronous way. For example, the long term fix that they are shown, it looks synchronous, but it is not doing heavy lifting in a synchronous call. It would be generating the configuration files and caching it so that it can just basically percolate the file downstream. Right? So kind of semi-synchronous, uh, the request will be made synchronous, but the processing would not happen synchronous. It would be pre-generated and it would just be sending the file upon request. So very quick response time you will get uh, very low load on their service and it would not go down frequently. Second key, key, second key takeaway from this, rate limiters are great, although we saw how rate limiter was the one that caused this outage, but it does not put it in a bad picture. It is very essential even, and this is a good thing that a rate limiter is employed even for an internal service, right? Because it is very important, very important to rate limit. We saw in, in previous videos how important rate limiters are uh, so that our system and things don't go down and no one abuses each other's service. So rate limiters are great, but for internal service, we might have a little higher uh, threshold rather than having a very strict SLA, you might go lenient depending on the services. And three, third, a very important key takeaway is here, what I feel, this is my personal opinion, what I feel is GitHub should have, although they would have had this internally, but GitHub should have classified their services into multiple tiers. So almost all big organizations, what they do, all the microservices that they have, they classified into multiple tiers. Let's say tier one, tier two, tier three. So tier one services that you have is if it goes down, it would take everybody with it. It is that critical of a service. Tier two services are important, but even if it goes down, you, your, your partial website can still function. And tier three services, if it goes down for a little longer, it's okay. Right? So what should happen is of uh, periodic audits should happen for the services and see if their classification is okay. For any tier one service, wherever there is any sort of classification or whenever any service is classified to be a tier one service, the interaction of that service with every other service should be as asynchronous as possible. So, and it should be very, it should be audited periodically to ensure 
that we are not having any blind spots right because if tier 1 goes down everything goes down with it right so having sort of tiered nature uh really helps over here uh obviously github ha would have it in their organization but maybe a miss here or there it it happens it happens at work like you you can't blame anyone for anything right so creating tiered services is very important and classifying them and ensuring that tier 1 especially are periodically audited and we don't have any blind spots in that yeah that's it it's a very very short video but yeah that's it there is a very interesting key takeaway uh, key takeaways that's why i wanted to cover this but yeah i hope i hope you like this quick uh, dissection i hope you learned something new today great so that's it that's it for this video if you guys like this video give this video a thumbs up if you guys like the channel give this channel a sub i post three in depth engineering videos every week and i'll see you in the next one thanks a ton